Hi and welcome to this week's episode of the DW Podcast. Uh, before we start again, thank you to everyone who's tuned in before, uh, very much appreciated. This week uh, I'm joined by some local Lanarkshire legends, the La Fontaines. Where are they? <laughs> they coming soon. <laughs> uh, Kerr and Jamie have both joined us just off, off the back of uh, another tour uh, that they've been doing, so I thanks very much for, for coming on. Thanks for Cheers having for us, mate. Aye. Cheers for the juice. No worries. We're actually parked at my back garden. Uh, thank you for inviting us into your home. <laughs> it's, nice. it's been our first uh, day of summer, I would say, so I thought I'd in, invite you along and we'll try not to get too freezing as a night goes on. It's cold, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. Because the sun's all there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting in the shade. Uh, so, I, what's been happening? Just back from tour, mate, like you said. Just came back last week from a UK Irish, Irish tour with a band called Death of Anna. We were supporting that. And uh, it was... Tremendous, wasn't it? Yeah, it was good. It was uh, Very good. really, really good. And now we're just back in, just finishing off work on our third album. So where were you still? How many dates did you do? What was... It was like 18, 18 days. I think it was 15 gigs over 18 days. Uh, I've had to say it that many times, I should know it by now, but I think it was Cardiff, Portsmouth, Bristol. England. England, aye, aye. England, England, aye. 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 England, we recently, for this record, we just jumped up to like, like a bigger label, who, who they are on. Where we like Band of Skulls and um, Placebo. Placebo. Are they? Eh? I think so. Aye. And then, uh, <laughs> aye, and basically we we met them at a festival in Germany, and they kept saying things all the time, like if there's a band you should tour with, it should be Death of Anna, like they love a drink and all that. Like that was literally all people would say, like they love a drink, use like a drink. The other. That was the chat all the time. And uh, I thought it was one of the like daft things that just folks saying that you go and meet them and they're like stone cold sober or whatever. <laughs> they're not to quite be, Scottish. No, exactly. Uh, but, but, uh, to be fair though, they they like a drink. That festival in Germany, looked <laughs> like they said Death of Man and Dress when we looked in, they were all like, as a five in the afternoon, but us done in bottles of vodka and all that, <laughs> cheering. <laughs> and that. They were right. Aye. Aye. And uh, they were absolutely brand new, man. I, I, it's probably, probably the soundest band we've ever toured with. You're going really, really well with them. Just stupid things like if you've ever been in a band before and and then you're a support band, you know the score with your rider, like you travel, let's say for instance it was Glasgow to London, seven, eight hours, and you're starving and you get to your dressing room and even if you're playing a 2,000, 3,000 cat venue, you've got like six Walker's Crisps, six Red Stripe and a bit of bread. No, I think it's, I say there's like six of us, there'd be five Red Stripe. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> aye. No, aye. Like, aye. Not aye. 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 A wee tubby aye. salsa aye. for some reason. Aye. Miscellaneous salsa. Oh, uh, carrots. Aye. A bag of carrots and Stupid five Stupid things like that. And like they were right away, they were like, look, like, when we're on stage or whatever, we're going to just come in and scram our rider. Which is I good, because usually we'd get in like when the main band's on stage, we just go in and steal it. <laughs> Wait till they go on stage, we've been doing that for 10 years, going in and Stealing band riders when they're on. Guys can buy like that, what's happening here? <laughs> and, uh, we've got a few laptops out of it and all. Aye, we've right? still a lot of good <laughs> stuff. It's probably why a lot of bands don't like taking us in tour. No, I just I go in and steal their uh, other beer and all that, but definitely I never seen. It's the right to steal our beer. They'd said to us before, like, any one going to take it, like, sound, because <laughs> we, we, we weren't like, going to anyway. <laughs> and did they ask, they ask you to go then? Aye, so they, 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 were, they were cool with it. They were like, aye, let's have them on board, man. And then, because we met them in Germany, we were going pretty well. And then when the tour came up, they had us. And uh, aye, we got on great. And I, I think we're going to go back to Europe again um, later this year with them. And they're, they're doing pretty well in Germany and stuff now. So it'll be bigger shows for us again. And I mean, like, the past couple of years, we've been fortunate enough to go to Europe quite a bit. Places like Germany and France and... Uh, Holland and that, and they've they're really receptive, man. To like her, whatever we're doing, I think over there as well. It's like over here, rather, you need a for somebody to validate it all the time. You need like a co sign from like Annie Mac or something to say, like, this is good, go and listen to it. So, the industry, like, you need the taste maker to be like, no, that's sound, you can like this. Whereas over there, it's very much like but they'll see it and they'll like it. 
and if they if they like it, then that's all it needs. So it's like it's it's almost like an easier in right away, and also just being they like having British bands over. Like I mean, there's daft things that like we've we've played in Poland to seven folk, and you've got like they put you up in a hotel, and they'll they'll have an unlimited beer and food and all that. You just <laughs> treat it so much better. And you're of tubs of salsa. I get salsa <laughs> like four or five salsas. And, uh, <laughs> Big bottles of vodka and all that. You just treat it a lot better than you are over here. And I think it's because there's over here there's such an abundance of bands that you're spoiled for it. So promoters don't really give a fuck, do you know? Yeah, they can do whatever they want. Aye, well, uh, you just treat it a lot better. So I love, we love playing Europe. So you go back with them and uh, later on this year it'd be really good for us as well. And just about growing that over there, it's like the ripple effect. You need to kind of spawn somewhere and just keep plugging away at it, man. What's your one city in Europe that you... Love. Love. Hamburg. I've seen you say that before. Oh, Hamburg's great, man. Uh, Reaper band. Where's, where is the Reaper band? Hamburg. That's right? Hamburg. Hamburg, mm-hmm. sorry. Aye, that's, that's an amazing... This club called the Molotov, which is just... It's just... It's right in the middle of the strip. It's almost, right in the aye. middle of the mayhem. Aye. And uh, it's a great place to play. Really good club. Also, like, like uh, Stuttgart in Germany is really good as well. Um with the loads of good gigs in Germany, that place, and Paris has always been good for us as well. In uh, Amsterdam. Amsterdam's amazing. Aye. We've got a gig, uh, we're, we're playing in Venice. Oh, we've got a festival in Venice coming up, it's called Home July. Festival. Have you been to Venice before? Aye, we've done a video. Brilliant, man, eh? done a video in Venice. In fact, oh, of we, course, eh? Yeah. One of the boys that used to be in the band, John, before he left for Greener Pastures, uh, just before he was getting his way out, he was like, we just, put an album out and one of his songs was called Common Problem and he was kind of main boy singing the chorus but he couldn't make the, the shoot so I was an idea to like I had a blow up doll and I'd, I'd got a mask of his face and I just carted that about Venice but if you ever been to Venice you know it's like this was it like nuns and that kind of it's a pretty holy place <laughs> so it just looked like we were in this mad ridiculous stag do with this <laughs> blow up doll when gondolas and all that sitting like having blow tacking like a fag to the wee guys the guy's mask face and all this <laughs> just it was nonsense must be the most civilised stag do destination aye ever, exactly aye <laughs> <laughs> where do you go on your stag do or Venice mate totally man but it's a beautiful place and then we took a car from there went up to like Lake Garda and done some stuff it was great man it was a really we fought it enough with this to travel about quite a bit which is probably the reason you still do it as much you know I suppose struck my way back to the start you've been going for what 10 years maybe or more probably, yeah. 11. Aye, about 11. About 11 years this year, I think. Yeah, uh, and it's always been with myself, Jamie and Daz. Um, 12 maybe, if we were done the first demos. Aye. I was 17. We're a heritage band. <laughs> <laughs> Vintage. <laughs> Vintage, aye. But we've done it since we were wee, like we were like 17 or whatever when we started. And then, uh, aye, it's been, it's been mad, man. It's like, it's just, at the very start, it was because we, we make music that's different or it whatever. It is different, and I suppose when you started, it was almost really different. Aye, well, it was like, it was, nobody <laughs> done that. I mean, I, I don't, there's not really anybody else that does it now. I mean, there's, I suppose you could go like, 21 Pilots or a, a band that like, have rap and rock in it or whatever, and, but it's, I mean, even, even saying that, rap and rock sounds stinking. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> On paper, it looks... So I'll be, we're just a, we're a rock band, is what we are. And I just so happened to rap or whatever. But uh, at that point, I don't even know how it came about. It's not as if we ever get in a studio and we're like, let's go and make this type of music. It was just, that's what I'd done. And that was the only way we could fit me in, really. I and suppose it, knowing you is from round about this area and where we are from, it almost seemed to me as if he's got the best drummer, the best guitarist, you know. I will, he's, he's made almost like a kind of... Why not try our super I group, I would say. Aye. Well, it, was, it kind of was that, like, it, I, I kind of started it with, with Daz, obviously we knew, Daz used to be in your band, and uh, before I stole him, and then, uh, <laughs> no, so I knew he was a great guitarist, and then I heard that he was a really good drummer, stole him. He heard my drums. I heard, I heard your drums, <laughs> I. He's stealing quite a lot of things over sold, the years. I was missold, man. And, uh, <laughs> aye, and, then, and then we just, uh, anybody that was willing to come and play, and then we made the music, and we just, we kept going for there and it was like the first gig was at King Tut's which at that time was like oh my god man why is you playing because at that time as well like King Tut's isn't what it used to be no it was like a, it seemed to have a lot of kudos then it probably still does maybe it's just I'm too far removed from it now 
But, uh, no, you're a bit more big time, Ken, aye. That's me, I've, I've changed, man. <laughs> <laughs> we, g- we did the gigs. I'm not playing kick tats again, mate. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, aye, so it's that, and then we then it kind of went. It went, I don't know if it went quick, because I mean, we're 11 years, but, but it's it's always been like on the incline or whatever. But it almost seems like he's never had to do all these, as you say, daddy gigs before you played somewhere like King Touch, you know, it was like your youth. When that happened, what, did you have one song out before Aye, you... aye. I mean, I may be here, but then I was certainly, we certainly made up for it. We've done enough giddy, diddy gigs. Since. Since, <laughs> I, Do you know what I mean? We've done our fair share of the diddy gigs. Which you, you need, man, like, to, to... Like, it's all experience. You need to know how to play the bar staff. And you need to know how to play Thousands of Folk and then or whatever, and then you somehow... That's just how you learn. What's the craft. biggest daddy gig you've done? Where you thought this is? That's, as that's as probably as good. Like the going to Poland. I mean, if I think about the drive we've done to Poland, and then plenty of, like seven folk or whatever, you suddenly think to yourself, <laughs> "I must really love this." <laughs> I mean, one of, doing this. one of the first gigs we've done, we get booked for. We just knew we were playing Ock and Lick. Oh. So it turned up, but it was like a play of the year dance. <laughs> <laughs> somebody, whoever booked the bands is just like somebody's going, I know a band, this band are good, and it's, it's rather than like, what, what's a suitable band we can get for this play of the year dance? And that turn up and with, to play for an hour or longer or whatever, having to just like play songs twice and all that. Because <laughs> they must have thought they were getting like a covers band or something. <laughs> So it just does what he's like. We never done that it. There was one song, an old song we had called Sense City, and it was like just warming up, sort of forcing us out to have a good time, like <laughs> dancing like, with the bags in the middle. It was like a football team. Aye, it was, aye, a, aye, it was, it was talking like juniors. Like. <laughs> you were on playing like bizarre. Superstar and all this. And, oh, <laughs> madness. So we've done enough stuff like that, man. Uh, but it's so important that like to turn your stripes as such, you know? To then, uh, I suppose, like, take it really far. I feel like just there with the stun India, went to Mumbai, was one of the most surreal things I've ever done. Even though I didn't even know they'd done Western music out there, do you know what I mean? Really? And, uh, I, didn't know, I didn't know India had done gigs. I, I just thought it was like <laughs> madness. Really? Bollywood everywhere. And uh, we went and we played, played in Mumbai the first night, and then we went to this festival in Pune, it was called. It was called uh, the week, Bacardi Weekender, and it was like thousands and thousands of folk that just gone absolutely nuts, man, <laughs> losing control of their limbs. I was like playing this because we were playing super futuristic music, as they called it. <laughs> Did you say that? <laughs> super futuristic music, man. I was like, Thank you. But that was just a mad <laughs> place. It was like, uh, and then like just daft things like. Doug's parting for like eight hours straight in India. That, that happens. <laughs> like going down a street and there's like a goat in a plank of wood. <laughs> stunning. How did I, it come about? How did they, like you've got your own booking agent, obviously? And... Aye, so the, the agent never got us that. The agent, you find the agents don't get you a lot of gigs. <laughs> they're, just, they're just there. And uh, it came about through a label or something like that. that somebody asked us to go out and do some stuff. And then aye, it was just a lot of these things come about randomly. Can I find like somebody knows somebody that's asked or have seen us somewhere else or because we're out and about as much, like I suppose you get more chance of getting seen. Aye, great though. Is there a lot of poverty in India then? Was it a bit an it's, eye opener? It's poverty like you've never seen in your life, yeah. next to wealth like you've never seen in your life, like next door. So some guy staying in this like the equivalent of a Fitma stadium, that's how big it is or whatever, and then there's just a wee guy in a shack or on the street. And there's like I mean I stepped in like a dead rat where it was pretty hoofing. What rats like that kicking about? Hey, there's like sort of slum bits built on the side of skyscrapers and that. It's mad, eh? But amazing it's an amazing though. place. An amazing place. Like How's the food? Brilliant. You hear of that deli belly, don't you? Like, folk get them. I, I was alright. I, I found uh, alright for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not too bad. I it was, uh, I'm not too, too hot with the spices, I must say. So then I found it all so so. Just kind of watching what I was eating, but eh, I mean the food over there as well. It's like one of the things we could take out a few nights with like the to like Bollywood Hills as such, and like with the guy that was there to like take us about and show us all the sights. That was the kind of thing that they had hooked up for us, and it's in there. I don't know if it's in a tradition or it's, it was just this guy's kindness, but like 
do the order, you eat everything on the menu sort of thing and just bring it out, keep bringing it and you just keep eating this stuff and I'm <laughs> parry with the spice, man. <laughs> Pure like, mmm, thrown away and all that. I love it. Uh, Aye. I, love I suppose it's stuff. just a different hospitality, isn't it? Absolutely. But that's, I mean, that's the, the best thing of it. I think the best thing of it, the, being in a band, is been afforded the opportunities to go to all these different places under different circumstances, as you would be as a tourist as well. If I think of the first time I went to New York with my missus and we had a normal like holiday and it was still class or whatever, but then when we went with a band, you go and you, you feel like you see, you see like the real parts of the city more. Aye, you're not you, going to the Empire you're State. Not going, you're not going to Times Square or whatever. And I just feel like that the, the main thing with this is like you get the, the opportunity to travel which and get to see so many different cultures, which helps everything, man. Like that's, that's you often find that stops everything from like, like racism and like it, when, when you see like people's different cultures and you realise they're just kind of the same as you or a bit different, you take wee parts of that. It's a hundred percent the best thing for me about doing this job. <laughs> I suppose for me that's quite prevalent as well. The places that are almost the most racist areas are the most isolated that don't have a high level, you know. Hundred percent. I mean it's like it's so insular. Yeah, so you're known as your wee area, your wee pocket of the world. And unfortunately, a lot of people can't, maybe don't have the means to go and explore it financially, it's restrictions and all that. But if you have the opportunity, then I can I recommend it nearly enough? It's just uh, you feel like you're all one. It from. seems like you do have a, a total different scale. Eh? Before we started filming this, we, we were talking about, you know, sometimes you done a, done a live video a few weeks ago and you were saying, oh, we've got a tenner each for dinner and we've got four cans just between five years and whatever, <laughs> but then you go to India and you're treated like royalty and it almost, I feel that when people think of bands, they almost think if you're in a band, you're touring the world, you're making millions. Aye, definitely. And they're so far removed with the, the truth. Especially now, like, I mean, how many people do you know that buy music? It's very, very few. And streaming's such a big thing, you think you're like, oh, streaming numbers and stuff, your songs get million plus plays and all that, like, you think, oh, class. Break that down. Let's say it's like, what, four grand for every million streams, and then you time you split that four ways, and then your manager and blah, blah, blah. Lucky lawyers you're, and... Lawyers, you're lucky you got 40 quid off it. Over 12 years. Exactly. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And it's... It's just that it's a weird thing. I mean, you make money from your gigs. That's how you make... And the, and the higher, the more tickets you can shift, then the more value you're worth it. So that's how you can make money now. I mean, and then your merchandise and all that. There's, there's certainly ways to, to make it profitable, but it's 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 by no means a unless you're like Ed Sheeran or something or like we Capaldi's doing amazing now. You know what I mean? It's and you're a soul guy or or like or you're like Jerry, like Jerry Cinnamon or whatever, who's who's come up and he's doing it himself. It's amazing, and then that's all. That's all going to Jerry. So that's saying you want to get rid of Jamie then? So hopefully, <laughs> Daz in here today, so if I can get rid of Jamie, it'll just be me. Then that's ideal. You're a backing track. Exactly. So it'll be soon. Yeah. Hey, there's ways to make it, but it's it's nowhere near what, what you assume with the level you're at. The money doesn't really tie up no. whatsoever. However, the, opp like the, the, the opportunities you get to go in are, are good. Yeah, you need to look at the positives as well, don't you? Getting to go to India, that's better than... No getting to go to India. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> Aye, but some of the stuff's better than better than ever making a wage. Aye, it's Aye. experiences, and I often feel that you know you can't put a value in experiences and travelling places. Man, stories for the dinner table. It's like how I try and look at life. Like I've got some good stories. What are they? What's your one story that if you've a <laughs> thought round for dinner, you're going to tell them? I've never actually said that since before. Nobody's ever. Tell you this one. Yeah. Your great stories, then, mate. <laughs> uh, man, I don't know, like. If, talk about New York they're like Was that Tartan Week? Is Tartan that right? Week we took it took it for Scotland Week so Tartan Week in, in New York and we get marched up and down like Fifth Avenue and all these <laughs> Americans like for eight clapping you just walking down like, <laughs> like, it's it just mad it's mad and then uh, like black guys come up to you like yo I, I want to have Scottish and you're like aye sound. But he was saying he was Scottish aye like I want to have Scottish man I'm like oh cool man sound and uh, or like just mad or people who think they're Irish all the time. But anyway, like they, we played and we played in Central Park. Mark stopped and didn't they? I forgot all of it. That. <laughs> Do I mean, aye? Stories for the dinner table, uh, he's forgotten them. I just, I just, I just, <laughs> thinking about it. That's and, uh, amazing. I know it was. Playing in Central Park. 
it was, <laughs> it was mad. And then like, just some of these, we, some of these stories. Like, mind we met the Mexican gang, who were like, were just a, uh, that uh, they were. They were, ask, they were asking me for a fag or a lighter or something like that, and the manager, Artie, was telling me like, as if she was like, feeling them bad, I'd been talking to them, so I knew they were, they were, sound, they were, they were from Canada, they were Mexican, but they lived in Canada, and they were doing New York to get this pair of jeans you can only get there. And then, yeah. and then they were trying to like say, don't, don't talk to those guys, they're doing a sound, <laughs> and whatever, I don't know, but I was telling them we were playing the next night at the whatever. Mercury Lounge or something we were playing. Of a club we were playing and then <laughs> they turned up. They turned up to the gig and I was playing, you could see them all bouncing a bit and, uh, and then talking to him after it and then the manager ended up I don't know, they ended up hanging about with us for a few days, but just one of them was a tattoo uh, artist and he said he was got his, I was like, I don't have any tattoos man, but if I ever was going to get one it'd be like the new. Here were all my best pals, first time in New York and all that. And uh, he was like, I think he was just bamming me up that he was a tattoo artist. <laughs> She like, he drew this thing he was going to put in my back. I was drunk enough to have nearly gone to get it as well until I actually seen sun, sunlight when I seen it sobered up quite like this is mental. It was just this mad drawing, looked like something from the Goonies, like the I the Goonies or something. How he drew it. It's just it's just very artistic. <laughs> Aye, and and, and then that was the same restaurant we met like Daniel Craig and all that, and we were all like singing Skyfall at him and all this, and <laughs> just those stupid things like that, man. That are just did they have not run a story on that? Some, I mean, they, blew, they blew the proportions if they made it as if I'm up and crack Daniel Craig or whatever. <laughs> I it as if like we were having to get escorted out by his security, you know, that was the, the son. I think what really <laughs> happened was he was in the restaurant and we were like, Here's Daniel Craig. <laughs> and then we were up and asked for a picture or something and these mad security guy said no and then we came back and went, Oh, we never got in and then we started singing Skyfall. But that get made out as if we started singing Skyfall right in his face and then we get <laughs> launched out and never getting back into America and all this. Same thing when we went to Morocco and we done the, the the video in the desert, and uh, like you, you need a permit to film in a lot of these places. So basically, the music video it's like usually you sp spend a couple of grand and you just get bands just playing in a a live setup and it's boring to watch. So we always just thought, why don't we just take that money and just go on holiday with it and take a camera and film some stuff, man. It look good anyway. We'll have a good time. Totally. And uh, we went to like Marrakesh. She was bonkers, uh, and like, but you need a, especially over a place like that, you need like a, a, a filming permit to, to actually film there. And they pulled pulled up at one point where I was right in the middle of the road doing this like sync thing to camera. And it was just scooters in and out about you, and it was amazing looking. And they pulled up and they're like, follow us. Put us in a van or whatever, took us to this mad like meeting, like the holding cell bit, and it was a. Uh, <laughs> They were terrified. Aye, man, they're all shouting Arabic and all that at you and saying, you, you work for BBC and all this. I'm like, no, honestly, I don't. <laughs> anyway, you do sometimes. Aye, I suppose right, I don't know. Right, right. right. I do, you. They were fortune tellers. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, they, but like, they wanted to delete all the stuff and the guy where we Oscar was savvy enough to pull the camera out and like, fire it down his trousers or whatever <laughs> and just take random pictures while we were walking there so it looked like we were just tourists because he wanted to delete all the stuff we just spent like five days filming. And then he had us in this holding cell for like hours, man. And like saying we walked for the BBC and all this stuff. And then they all just seemed to like leave after a while. <laughs> and we're in this bit and like. And they were going to find somebody that could translate. And I, then, uh, but then eventually uh, they, they, they showed they up. There, so we just sat <laughs> so we just, and we just, just walked it. We left and went back to our hotel and then. We were like, that was pretty mad, wasn't it? And then like a few hours later, it felt like full Marrakesh SWAT team showed up at the hotel, wanting us to, they came into the room and all that, and like, try to flip the beds and stuff to try and get us out. But then, so that night we were like, let's just leave here, and we went straight to the Sahara Desert and filmed there. But then like that story came back to the paper somehow, and it made it as if we'd like shot a few <laughs> Moroccans or something and <laughs> never allowed back in and all this. You took that Mexican Mexican cartel for exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so just mad stuff. How do you choose the locations then? What made you? He usually comes up with them. Uh, I had been to Marrakesh before, and just to be good, exciting colours and all that sort of thing to film. We went to. Going to the desert was good because you go as a tourist and they, they call it the Coca-Cola desert. That's like the, it's a crap theme park one. 
we met this boy, it was like, no, I'll take the real desert, Sahara one, remember the scorpion in the tent, not us? Right. And then uh, he took us right to this, like the real, the big dunes and stuff, man, and it was just, it was like, you have to type in like, you type in desert in your screensaver, like in your computer, it was like that, it was just amazing. And uh, I but with, with the videos and stuff, it's usually Jamie that comes up with like with Venice, he said that as well. And then uh, done a wee video in India, because we were there. Just places that look interesting that on camera look good. It's almost like if you're watching a video, you want to look at something that is fun rather than a band just playing in the room because you could see oh, that anyway. Right. boring, isn't it? Yeah. Regardless how good the song is, I suppose it's quite... I mean, I know it's a standard thing, showcases the song and stuff, but... I mean, that was that same video, I remember I phoned up Murrayfield Stadium. The idea was that every time I hit the camera, it spun to a different location. Right. So I'd hit it, and I'd be, we were at the Barris. I'd, I'd <coughs> hit it, and we'd, then we'd be in London. When I, like, Emirates, like, flight simulator thing, hit it again, I was back at Murrayfield. But to get to Murrayfield, I phoned them up and was like, tell them the, the pitch of the video. And they were like, are you getting any money for this? Because it costs, like, I think it was something stupid, and the, the, the figure will be after it, let's say it was, like, some like, seven grand to just fire the lights on in Murrayfield. And I was like, look, I don't even have... 70 quid to give you. Or like, all right then, fine, just come. <laughs> You're just, joking. No, I swear, ended up getting it for nothing as long as we sent a tweet out and uh, <laughs> saying that we were filming there and they, and they had the full Murrayfield Stadium with like the song playing and like all the, <laughs> the, the visuals for the song on the big screens and all that, just me doing sync. And then that spun and then we were in like Marrakesh or whatever. It was just like, it's just interesting to watch, I think. Well, That's hopefully, good. anyway. So you are on your what, third album now? Third album now, eh? What's your, your favourite album? This one. Is it? Hi. You're Aye. not saying that just because folk want to listen to it? Uh, no, it's because I'm the singer now. Aye. I want to sing all his songs. I think without giving a band answer, one of the, it's our best work, man. <laughs> Aye, it's our best work. <laughs> I think we just got, I think it's very concise. I think it's like we know exactly. We know what, know what we're doing. Yeah, we know what we're doing. We know what music we make and we know. I just think all the strong su song structures and stuff are better, and I think it's just better songwriting, and it's just better tunes, and it feels good to be to be playing. Sorry, mate, we it's all right, no. keep me up. And the uh, <laughs> God, I'm a bit bored this way. <laughs> Fed up, please. See when you're see when you're setting out an album, do you have a theme for the whole thing, or do you do it song by song? Or what's the process behind writing an album? Because I suppose if you're writing one song, it's a bit easier than thinking I'm going to put together ten to twelve tracks here or so. Daz, he, he makes the music. So the guy that's not here, he makes the, he comes up with the actual music for it now. <clears throat> he has done for the past couple of albums. Like we used to be in the first album, we'd all be in the studio jamming it, making it happen, which is still good. But uh, he comes up with the actual basis of the, the instrumentation, brings it to us. Jamie will put his his version of the drums on it. Daz puts all the guitar and bass on it, and then I'll that the song. As naff as that sounds, it seems to, the music tells me what to write or whatever. That's like a certain feeling for it. You know. So do you have like a, a basic rhythm track and then you put your lyrics on top? I, so I, I, usually the way he demos the songs, they come almost as complete songs. So, I mean, the demos now as well, people making, he makes it in Logic. It's, I mean, there's people that are in the charts with songs are made in Logic and that's it. They just record the guys on their computer and it sounds good enough now, you know. Uh, so I, I get pretty much a... Certainly like a 80% finished song anyway. So that, then I just write to that and then me, I pick a, I don't know, sometimes I don't even pick a theme, I just write and it seems to go somewhere and and then we go and we, Jamie does the chorus, we write the chorus, he comes up with the melody and then we, have a, we go and record it and that's, that's the song. And then Mary do that, the Mary it starts to feel like maybe well, it seems to go on this subject or Maybe it becomes like, it's never really a concept. Like Class, our first album was kind of a concept album. It was all about like, the class system and and we also thought it was Class, we just called it Class. <laughs> uh, common Problems, kind of kind of some like political, so, uh, all my stuff's kind of like that. It like a, has a wee, a wee bit of my, Kick. not, not a preachy political view, but just how I feel or see the world. So it's always, it's always got to be a bit of that anyway. Kind of really like, write things like, but loving girls and all that. <laughs> I know. Just not very good at it, man. No. I was some stuff. Jamie could do that. Aye, Jamie's he's a man finding that your soul stuff. 
So you've had a few lineup changes. You mentioned you're the singer now, Jimmy. So I suppose that's a big stage to step up to because you're. It's kind of easy for you. You're playing drums at the same time. You play a click track as well. And I, I was like singing and that, played the drums, but just when it sit at me because it's it's hard today. Both so just when it was easy bits today, uh, day harmonies and stuff like that. But um, hi, I'm getting better at it. But I am confident now, so I suppose when you said that, uh, your most recent lineup change, the first gig after it was, was it the boy for Lincoln Park? Or? Aye, that's not a good story. That was, <laughs> we went down to, we were playing the round house, so it was our first gig as the three, and we were playing, it was like, certainly it was like 4,000 folk or whatever at the round house. And we were the only support, and uh, I went down and it was like, well, we'll get a good sound check and we'll just work us out here. So everything was different, like the lineup. How we were even lined up on stage was different. Like Jamie's no longer behind us; he's to the left of us now. And myself and then Daz. So that was even weird, just like looking about and there's nobody behind you. Uh, and then, like a really, really quick sound check because Mike Shinona took about four hours practicing this piano part. <laughs> <laughs> so we had no time to like practice or nothing. And then, uh, were you stressing? I was stressing, man. I was, I was especially after what happened. So like, the tour manager came, and this never happens. Like. It's very rare that a band care enough about support to even suggest this. So that I came down and the tour manager's like, yo, would you like to meet Mike? And I was like, I definitely, man, that'd be cool. So come with me, follow me, and I follow him up on stage and Mike's still playing this piano. And he's like, eh. I was like, by the way, before you start, man, like, huge fan and all that, <laughs> like, Linkin Park, but that hybrid theory album when I was a wee guy was like a mega, mega influence and all this. It's like, that's amazing you say that because, you know, tonight I would love you to perform a song with me. <laughs> I'm like, ah, class, class. And he's like, so do you know, do you know, you obviously know like Bleed From Within, whatever the song's called. And I'm like, ah, how, how's, how's, that, how's that go again? <laughs> and he's like, no, I didn't know that track. I didn't know the song, man. So he's like, <laughs> two minds. Is like, it on that album? <laughs> I no, it was not the theory. Right. Nene's new And he's I like, I think it was a, like a newer one. So, but Nene's new after saying. Two minds like, if there's a time to learn, and it's now, kid. <laughs> so I'm running back to the, the dressing room, like, fuck, I need to learn this song, man. And then I was, I couldn't even mind the name it to Google it. And then I was like, what am I doing? I don't even, I've never even heard this song, we're going to try and learn it. And two seconds, I have to go back up and be like, oh, Sorry, man, I know I said I'm a huge fan and all that, but like, I don't actually know that song. <laughs> so, he was like, pure shock, giving it. No one's ever said that before. <laughs> no one's ever said no. <laughs> Did you know Hank of it saying, I know this one? Well, at, at, at the point where I was like, maybe we'll just go up and then just do the Maiden song. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Sorry, mate. It's the Maiden verse. <laughs> but I, that was, uh, so that was the first gig, but that, that was fucking madness. With a... Uh... Before we started as well, I was all, I was all confident. It was like, right, I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm singing this this part. Um, and then, just as we were about to go in, I was, two, uh, there was a guy there cutting hair for some reason. He, he done half my haircut. What and was then, it like, makeup artist sort of? No, I don't know why. Why was there? Just a guy comes. Sometimes you get folk that are like, I'll come and cut your hair or give you something free if you just let me into the show and for my social media stuff. So. We will embrace that. Uh, so we can cut here. Because we just a wee sound check and then a guy goes, do you want a haircut? And it goes, cool. And then so, uh, something goes right, you're on in two minutes. So i just done half a haircut. I was like, I'll, I'll get it finished when uh, when I finish the gig or whatever. <laughs> and if I, go, I got it in Sheffield about a week ago. <laughs> half an hour, might not look, look like it. But the go right, we're on in two minutes. So I took a hang off, shoot my hair right off and then... Uh, <laughs> So outside the stage, we've got this wee intro track that starts. Um, normally, I've got these headphones that I play with that keeps us in time. Because I can't stay in time while I'm in. <laughs> so I've got these uh, headphones, and it's, uh, they're pure crucial to the thing. Make sure that everything's in in time and all that. But normally, I have them sitting in the drums, but because I was trying to be so prepared for this, this gig in London, uh, I took them off stage with me so that I'd have them on. <laughs> So I didn't eat because I footed it to get in. So I, I thought I'll keep them on so they're on stage, but then the, the intro track came on and then uh, ready to go in. And I was like, 
oh fuck, I've not got these headphones. Uh, that they've not got the drums. I knew I'd walk on and I'd be like, just have to sit there and try and wing it. Then I, I ran back to the. Meanwhile, the American two managers going, "What the fuck, man? <laughs> Get on stage!" Because the track is like thirty seconds in, so we're meant to go on stage at this point. Like, what the I'd fuck? Come, and he's I'd, come up going, "Do have them?" <laughs> no, I'd run back to the. Um, ran back into the backstage, but the guy was cutting somebody else's hair, and I haven't to look out for these headphones. Cause I, I, yeah, I was sprinting. I was running through the the corridor, and I saw these mad American folk. No, and then. Uh, couldn't find the headphones and thought somebody must they must be in there. I need to run around and say to care that I can't find them. <laughs> and uh, I'm panicking. And then I ran around and then because I can run the wee door, I think somebody seen me and done that. So I thought, cool, somebody's got headphones. <laughs> <laughs> it was like right breathing and that. And then I go with there and I was like, oh, I don't know. And then I had to run back around again. I could see care. I'm running after him like something like whiplash, try to hit him. And I'm like, you fucking kidding me on, man, first gig. And then they were just on the table, we found them. And then we got on and they had like one half I wanted, one of Because they are footed again, I didn't have time. It was like, put one in and one of them fell off. So it was all dangling at him when I was playing. How did the gig go? It was alright. Aye, it was like, eh. Uh, it got better. Aye, I was I was saying <laughs> earlier, it was kind of like, eh. Uh, can you hear the, the lawnmower in the back? I know. Class. <laughs> I thought it'd be a good idea to do it outside and somebody started cutting their grass. It's a good day for us. Turn that off. Eh. I was like, a, in fact, my terms, it was like coming away and getting a, playing away and getting like a 1 0 1. We just get through it, sort of thing. It's good. It's like can this now until we. I don't know what this boy's going to be doing. So, what's the future plans then? Get the album out, man. Album finish, uh, finish recording the album and uh, tour it, man. We've got a tour in June for the album and it's, uh, it's genuinely like our best music we've ever made, so. That's why I put it out it's as many people as possible and see what happens with it. It's well, all going pretty well. There's a few Scottish dates on there, isn't there? Aye, we've got Glasgow, Edinburgh, Dundee, Aberdeen. I mean, the idea was we kind of took a risk with it because the only way you could really get a ticket was... Uh, <laughs> the only way you could really get a ticket <laughs> was uh, by buying a, an album and ticket bundle sort of thing. So we kind of... I'm playing smaller venues to, because that's usually a deterrent for people. People don't want to buy any music, just want to stream it, steal it, and then come. To, they'll, they'll come to your show, which is still fair enough. But we wanted to try and like sell this album, so we're. Uh, I, if you want to come see the show, you need to buy the album. Good. So please do it. I suppose playing in Scotland must be a, a strange one for you because you're so. She's so used to playing big stages now, aren't you? And then to go and play smaller Aye, venues. Aye, play ones, but I mean, it's still, again, it goes back to the old day. Uh, one more That's that boy back there now. Eh, he clearly ran out of grass, he pulled up his way back at the back there, he went and emptied it at the bin, and now he's back. Back at the back, Eh, aye, but it goes back to like the start again, where it's like you've, well, you've earned your sights, man, you've done it before, so it's not like a bike, it's not totally foreign to you. You're just going back playing some smaller shows, which sometimes can be better gigs, man. They're like more intimate. Aye, feel the audience more. Do you know what I mean? So you done transmit last year. That must have been a, a big one for you. Was it, Jimmy? Mhm. Mm aye, aye, but we didn't. You no, know, like we had time to be only go out the night of four or something, the day of four. We were in Germany and then saying, "Can you?" Uh, some guy had been arrested or. Somebody was playing some rapper or something like that, get caught with a knife or something. And then they asked us if we wanted to... I wonder if we could get any more noises happening here. <laughs> There's a dog out. There's a dog out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they asked us to play, so we were in Germany, I had to change. We were playing at a festival the night of four. And then I had to get... We were meant to fly back like the next day, the Saturday afternoon, just what a normal time, and I had to change the flight to fly for another airport for... I can't even mind, like Cologne or Dusseldorf or... Where the fuck we were, uh, to get back to Glasgow and then by, we flew to Edinburgh actually and then by the time we got there it was like 10 in the morning and then same again sound checking but I hadn't really been to bed or whatever sort of thing. It was good though, aye, yeah. well good. It's a good festival man. Aye, they're doing well eh? Yeah, I suppose good. if you're Scottish though, for a lot of young people it's almost like bring back to in the park but for me it seems like transmits a lot more hassle free for the organisers. It's I definitely, I mean, it's like the, there was some serious carry-on going on with 
team the park man they they get at campsite which probably canned that which helped can it can have festivals where people are dying all the time <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> people are dying all the time buckle aye <laughs> and uh, aye so they had to stop it and uh, it's been a pretty success, successful festival I suppose night. when you get a bit older it's good because you can go home at night and it's right in the city good man's in the city like I've been here I've done it the first year uh, I think we were on what were we at the Saturday night? Huh. We were on the Saturday night, but it took me about six days to get home or something like that. <laughs> I went on the Sunday and then I just stayed. Stayed it. <laughs> good times. Aye. So you seem to. It was good to know that I could get home. I wanted to. But... <laughs> I'll go home in six uh, days. Aye, aye, but just it took just me the next weekend, say. aye. I suppose uh, he's, a, he's a traveller a lot, so what, what do you do to relax, care? You do a bit of presenting as well. And... It's just not even relax, relax man, it's, it's just to make some extra cash, man. Like, I DJ when I'm back and, and I forget, some stuff for the BBC or whatever that I'm presenting, or some radio stuff or whatever, just anything, man. It's like anything, I mean, I've done, I've played, I remember the first time we played the main stage at Tina Park on the Saturday. On the Monday, I was working on a building site, fitting sash and case windows. But this guy kept talking about himself in the third person. Too black. Like, you get John that wee hammer there. <laughs> Jake, you go to Greg's and get John a wee sausage roll. What? Well, just speak. You're John. <laughs> we sitting all these five going like, "Don't worry, son. You'll play team the part one day." And I'm like, "I played it fucking six times. I'm still here with you." <laughs> so like, you, I mean, if you're in a tour in band, you can't really go and get a, a proper job because you need to go away all the time. So fortunately, this year because we've done. Or right, or we've been away as much. Like I've, when I come back, I just DJ or Jamie plays in, in the pubs or whatever. And Dad's a quite a good setup. He's where he can work when he's away from home. And uh, I mean, there's I mean, mate, it's standards. There's, there's top forty bands that work in Nando's. That's just a that's just a reality of this now. So if you want to date, you need to, at this stage. If we're like eleven years, twelve years deep, we're we're only doing this for the right reasons. Have to be. Because a savvy man would go around and get a, a job to make a proper living, but it's, you still get by, man. And you, as long as you can, you just kind of need to do everything to make what to make it like one thing. So if it's DJing, presenting, or whatever, like anything you've got that you can use to, to keep yourself going, you have to do. And that's that's the reality of being, a, I think, a, a a working musician. And I think that it's only going to get worse, like. It, my only fear, fear of it is that I hope that it doesn't become a, a really inclusive, like exclusive club where it's like it's only the, top like the rich right. that can can be musicians because it's hard to sustain this sort of life. Do you know what I mean? Like, unless you've got like your mom and dad's loaded or something, and you can just play at musicians for a while or play at bands because right. it's it's hard to keep yourself going. Jamie, you're never out of the, the pubs playing as well. <laughs> never out of the pub, Jamie. Never out of the pub. Eh, uh, aye. Four gigs on Saturday there. I like playing drums. <laughs> I like being in pubs. She's often get recognised when you're out and about. I've seen a lot of folk tweeting you and saying like, oh, I've just met Jamie and Kerr and... Eh, uh, aye, sometimes. Aye. Run about here, whatever, but no. Never get recognised in India. <laughs> no. You so, played, so that gig, played that gig in Motherwell at Christmas and I remember turning up a few hours before it and there was like what, five German folk had come over. I know, there's people that take it pretty. I just fought there for Italy, France, Spain. So I've seen the Motherwell yeah. tourism board be booming, man. <laughs> weird playing. <laughs> no, it's, uh, I, it's just a... Uh, it's weird calling them fans and all that, isn't it? It's like, fans. <laughs> fanatical. <laughs> I, fanatical fan. <laughs> Aye, man, it's like it's party, isn't it? If uh, people are, you appreciate it, man. If they're, if they're into your music, then it's nice to just say hello and whatever. And mm. It's cool to, to really appreciate them liking it. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a hard question to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Do you get noticed? I, I, feel, no, I feel as if he's like he's come across really well with your fans. Like, Aye, well, it's just because we're normal. It's just because it's like I don't know how you could act any. I don't know, man. We're so because it, it we've been done it for as long as well. You're so grounded in the reality. Of it. Like we know what it's like to 
I play to thousands of folk and then the next day walk on the building site or it's just such a seesaw effect all the time. So there you go. Could be cutting grass next week. Aye, cutting grass could be cutting grass next week, man. I'm cutting grass next week. There you go. Nice one, where can folk check you at? Yeah, the internet. Just type in the laugh on brain. <laughs> and uh, Wishy baths. Wishy baths. Wishy baths. Jamie's came straight for the gym. And uh, aye, please if you never heard this before, check us out and if you have. And uh, it'd be nice if you supported us by buying our new album so we could dominate the charts. Where's your gigs? What dates? June sometime. Please just Google it, man. June. <laughs> check out the internet. So check out the internet and we'll have all the info. Nice one. Thank Thanks you very much for coming on. Days, mate. Cheers. Cheers. And, uh, <laughs> guys finished days. Guys, <laughs> guys finished cutting class. <laughs> Should get him over for a wee chat yeah. the next day. Nice one. Now, thanks to everybody uh, for listening to this episode again of the DW Podcast. Check us out on the internet. Uh, and thanks to Jamie and Kerr for coming on. Cheers, mate. Thank you.